Hi, everyone. Welcome to the CR event today. We appreciate everyone joining us for our discussion. I'm Matt Petrassi with Climate Advisors, which is part of the CR Consortium with Aid Environment and Profundo. We provide sustainability risk analysis for investors, banks, and NGOs. Today's event will feature chain reaction research and forest and finance to discuss recent research on who provides financing to companies tied to deforestation and palm oil supply chains. Asian banks have increased their exposure in loans and underwrite, in, in underwriting, while shareholdings and bond holdings by Western investors have declined. The recently updated policy assessments by Forrest and Finance show that only a small number of financiers and investors have policies that require palm oil related clients and their suppliers to ensure supply chain transparency and traceability. The lack of supply chain policies creates room for financing and investments to continue flowing to re refiners tied to deforestation. Forest and Finance will discuss potential uses of their financial database and their recently updated bank policy assessments and palm oil related studies. Our main speakers today will be Ender, Kaner, and Barbara Cooper of Profundo, along with Ford Bormerdam of Forest and Finance. First, some housekeeping. All attendees are on mute. Please use the Q&A function to ask questions. We will try and get to them after the presentation. We, and also we will put a recording of the event on our website in the next couple of days. And now over to Vord for the main presentation. Hi, thanks Matt. Yeah, so my name is Ward Wormerdam uh, from Profundo in the Netherlands. Uh, I coordinate the finance and tax, uh, I coordinate the forest and finance work uh, within Profundo. Um, yes, so um, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about forest and finance just a little. Uh, so forest and finance is a coalition of, uh, as you see now, eight members. Uh, initially, um, we started with Rainforest Action Network, Took Indonesia and Profundo ourselves where we research financial flows to forest risk commodities in Southeast Asia. Uh, last year, Reporter Brazil, Amazon Watch, BankTrack, Sabatella Malaysia, and Friends of the Earth US all joined the coalition. And next slide, please. So today I'll talk a little bit about forest and finance, uh, the new website, what it looks like, um, update of the financial research that we've done. This is the June uh, update, so from last uh, month where we updated the investment data. The creditor data will be invest, uh, will be updated in September of this year, September or October. And I'll also talk a little bit, a little bit about the policy assessments, uh, how, they're development, uh, how they're developed and uh, some, some ways you can interpret the findings, please. So the objective of Forest and Finance, which was set up in 2016, is to provide an open source data set linking financial institutions to companies engaged in forest risk commodities. Not all the companies in the data set actually engage in forest destruction or rights violations, uh, but they're at a high risk in a high risk sector. We wanted to show which financial institutions are financing these companies. Uh, and what policies they have in place to try to mitigate the most negative impacts of these forest risk uh, uh, practices, company uh, corporate practices. We want to hold the financial sector accountable by exposing these clients and where, uh, where their operations violate laws or financier policies. Next slide. So we've recently updated the website. Uh, some of you may have seen it before. This looks much more beautiful, beautiful colors and exciting uh, tools. So <clears throat> the website now has a number of uh, additional functions. You can do a quick view. Uh, you can dive into the detail of the data set revealing individual transactions, and you can look at the, the policies. There's also information on uh, recent reports and some uh, the, the media. Um, links you can also, which you can find in insights and in case studies. So identifying trends in these and compare the compare the financial institutions tools allows you to to conduct your own analysis <clears throat> of uh, financing trends by uh, financial institutions. Let's say from a particular country or a particular region, or uh, financial institutions financing a specific set of companies that you're interested in. We're looking at trends over time, looking at different commodities, looking at different regions, 
looking at different uh, types of finance. So it's a tool that is intended uh, for civil society organizations, media, and, and other interested researchers to uh, create their own analysis of forest risk uh, financing. So we've provided the tools that allow you to do so, sort of the portal, but you can also download and export uh, all your searches. You can share them uh, with, a, with just a link. Next slide, please. And so here's some of the results of the investor data. And maybe quickly, uh, a, a quick note on how we conduct the, the financial research. So we have a selection of approximately 380 uh, companies engaged in forest risk commodities active in Southeast Asia, Latin America, and Central and West Africa. And we research financing to these companies by using uh, Refinitiv, Bloomberg, uh, IJ Global, and Trade Finance Analytics, and three big data sources. Uh, Refinitiv and Bloomberg are used for syndicated financing, uh, Emax, part of Refinitiv is used for its bond holdings and Refinitiv is used for shareholding information. But we also conduct a lot of manual research. So we add additional financing, bilateral financing by going through annual reports, company registries and media archives. And we add pension fund data, which is relevant for this investor update. We add the pension fund data manually because not all of it is included in the financial databases. So we go through uh, the largest pension funds globally, including those from the Netherlands and Sweden, uh, Japan, Norway, in other countries uh, and the US, so CalPERS, CalSTRS, and we add that to the data set. For all financing that we identify, we try to attribute, to, so each financial relationship we identify between one financial institution and a company, we try to calculate what proportion of that specific company's business activities in that particular year can be attributed to any of the six deforestation risk commodities that we look at. And so for each position, we can calculate that uh, proportion. We also calculate what proportion of that specific business activities in that particular year can be attributed to one of the three forest rich regions that we look at. So this is then an outcome of the, the study, the slide you're looking at now. So we identify that 50% of the investments are going to palm oil and 21% to pulp and paper, 10% uh, to, to beef and 11% to rubber. Uh, two thirds of the finance uh, of the investments in bonds and shares uh, can be attributed to uh, Southeast Asia, and in total, it's about forty-six billion dollars in investments. Next slide, please. Uh, looking at who the largest investors are. Uh, not very surprisingly, the big Malaysian financial institution, there's a government linked to investors at the top is because palm oil is the largest and Southeast Asia was largest. And so PMB and EPF from Malaysia are the largest financiers followed by uh, BNDS from Brazil and uh, the US uh, asset managers, BlackRock and Vanguard. Uh, next slide, please. The largest companies that are receiving the investment, the companies that are receiving the largest amount of investments are Sam Darby, the large palm, palm oil company, Susano, pulp and paper company from Brazil, Top Glove, rubber company from Malaysia, and JBS, uh, the large beef uh, company from Brazil. And uh, next slide, please. Then we dive into the data from Southeast Asia. Well, investors held $30 billion in forest risk bonds and shares uh, in companies uh, active uh, that were attributable, sorry, to Southeast Asia. Three quarters of this financing of these investments uh, were, at, uh, were in palm oil companies just because a lot of palm oil companies, as you probably know, are listed on the stock exchange. Uh, smaller amounts can be attributed to uh, rubber, which a lot of palm oil companies do also, and uh, pulp and paper. And uh, about, Two thirds of the investments came from uh, Southeast Asia and East Asia. So uh, from Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, South Korea, Japan, and China, with only 20% coming from North America and about 10% yeah, coming from Europe. Next slide, please. The largest uh, investors there, again, very similar to the, to the previous slide, is uh, PMB and EPF from Malaysia are the largest investors in Southeast Asia, but also QAP is uh, now ranking higher, and it's uh, followed by um, financial institutions, so US asset managers. And the largest investments are in Sam Darby, Top Glove, IOI, so palm oil and uh, rubber companies. Now on to the, uh, the policy assessment methodology. So uh, this is one of the key features of the Forest and Finance website. We've uh, carried out policy assessments of about 55 financial institutions at the moment, and we will launch the, the full 200 financial institutions uh, in September of this year. So uh, later on this year, keep your eye out for the 
the policy assessments of 200 financial institutions, that's 100 banks and 100 um, asset managers, insurance companies and pension funds, sort of a mix of those of that group of investors. So the policy assessment methodology is based on uh, sort of international best practices. So the standards that uh, internationally are ex expected of companies that companies uh, operating well should be upholding. This includes standards from the ILO for the, for the labor standards, um, things like the NDPE uh, commitments for deforestation, exploitation and development on peat, uh, practices from the OECD guidelines, the UNPRI, the UNPRB. Uh, sort of the, these kind of international, internationally accepted uh, best practices. There, we have 35 criteria in these minimum standards. We've separated them into three categories: environmental standards, so what we require, what we expect financial institutions to demand of their clients or investees in terms of uh, mitigating deforestation. So no deforestation, no development on peats, and how they consider and protection of uh, water and access to water and biodiversity. Uh, standards, uh, social standards, um, uh, mostly in, in things related to the labor rights issues and uh, rights of indigenous communities, so, and whether or not a financial institution demands FPIC of its clients or, its, uh, or to make sure that the investees have demanded um, FPIC in their operations and governance standards, including things such as transparency, how transparent is the financial institution, what demands does it have of transparency of its clients, whether or not the financial institution has a grievance mechanism and things such as uh, yeah, how they require the companies they finance to, to not engage in uh, tax evasion um, and corruption. So these policies are all assessed, sorry, just back. <laughs> yeah, uh, these policies are all assessed separately for the six forest risk commodities that we're looking at. Uh, we've done this because uh, some financial institutions will have policies on beef, but maybe not on palm oil. Uh, or we'll have something on pulp and paper, but nothing on rubber. Um, we've uh, looked at the policies for credits, so uh, loans and underwriting services separately from investments, simply from, uh, from the asset management activities of a financial institution. So we score the, the, the commodities all separately, all uh, separately also in terms of the types of finance. And we combine it into one overall score by using the financing amounts and the investments per commodities as was weighting factors. So if a financial institution has a great beef policy, but it doesn't invest a lot, of, it doesn't finance a lot of beef, then that's going to weigh less than the palm oil policy, which uh, it maybe has higher investments in. So this is how we weight them. And now we can go to the next slide. <laughs> And here is sort of an idea of what you'd see on the website. We've taken the institutional investor, DFA. Uh, so this is not a great policy. If you want to look at better policies, maybe uh, look up uh, BNP Paribas or ABN AMRO or ING. Uh, many of the institutional investors actually have poorer policies than the, than the banks. So this is what you'd see That's a separation per, sort of uh, per category. You can see the scores per commodity and how it's weighted. Uh, you can look at even more details on the website so you can see per element, per uh, commodity, uh, how they're scoring. And now onto the final slide. So this is the kind of detail that you could also see. I've exported this to Excel um, and highlighted a couple of the, the key cells uh, that are interesting. So. Uh, Vanguard doesn't require it, uh, the investees in, uh, in, that are active in palm oil that uh, they require themselves and that, that, they, that the investees and their suppliers must commit to zero deforestation and no conversion of nat natural forests. Um, and also they don't require the companies and the, and the, comp the investees and the, and the suppliers of these investees uh, to maintain supply chain uh, transparency and, system and traceability. So this is a bit of an overview of uh, forest and finance. Uh, for more details, uh, please feel free to look at the forest and finance website. Um, there's also a, um, a series of webinars you can find on YouTube uh, for more detail in the methodology and, and the case studies. Now I'll hand over back to Chain Reaction Research. Thank you. Thank you, Wart. Um, so we are now going to present a, well, basically a case study where we used uh, the data that VAR just uh, presented for our analysis. I'm just going to give a brief introduction to the topic and then hand over to Ender to present the uh, results from the financial analysis and policy analysis. As Chain Reaction Research, we have published several research papers on the state of 
so-called leakage in the very important palm oil refining sector. The light, latest of these papers has been published in May 2020. However, a recent check that we've done on the on whether the data is still correct has shown that the findings are still relevant. So there have been no relevant changes in the, in the list of companies that we have identified. Palm oil refiners, as shown on this uh, slide, are a strategic bottleneck in the global palm oil supply chain. It, the supply chain has the typical hourglass shape that can be observed in many soft commodity chains. In this case, there are thousands of palm oil plantations and mills at the top, uh, in the upstream segment of the chain. You have a similarly large number of consumer co goods companies in the downstream part of the supply chain. And then in the, yeah, probably what is uh, called the midstream segment, which also includes traders, but uh, the refining sector would also qualify as a midstream segment, probably. Um, there are just a few dozen large refiners, which gives these actors a strategic role in the supply chain. Um, since around 2013 14, the largest refiners have started adopting NDPE policies that Bart just mentioned, also as one of the criteria that are used in, for example, the policy assessment. So no deforestation, no peat and no exploitation policy, which if it is properly implemented, as with any policies, if they are not properly implemented, they are not worth the paper they are written on. Um, it is currently the, the strongest private instrument to cut the direct link between palm oil production and deforestation, as well as other detrimental environmental and social impacts in own plantations, as well as among third party suppliers. To make this uh, mechanism efficient, it would require the entire industry to follow such commitments, which is, however, not the case. And that is um, what we researched in, in these studies. Um, uh, we, well, there are basically five key performance indicators for NDPE implementation for refiners which are supply chain transparency, an operational grievance system, engagement with non-compliant growers, and if this engagement has no satisfactory results, a suspension of these suppliers, protocols for re-entry of earlier suspended suppliers, if they adapt their policy and, and conduct to, to provide a, a, a re-entry strategy into the supply chain, and importantly, also publication of regular progress reports. In the, the analysis that Chain Reaction Research has done, we have used um, the implementation of two key KPIs to assess refiners with NDPE policies and on their implementation. These are supply chain transparency and operational grievance systems. These are both um, yeah, crucial K KPIs because um, they are both um, enabling basically several of the other performance indicators such as engagement with non-compliant growers, because if there's no transparency, um, yeah, it's also harder to, for example, point um, companies to, to issues in their supply chain. Um, we analyzed, uh, if you could do the next slide. So using these two KPIs and the fact whether there are actually even NDPE policies, um, we looked at the top 25 palm oil refiners in Indonesia and Malaysia, and um, this analysis showed that refiners accounting for around 78% of capacity implemented NDPE policies, with an additional 5% that have a policy, but where meaningful implementation based on these two indicators uh, is lacking still. Um, yeah, uh, so we, what is obvious that there are still non-cooperating refiners that continue to leak uh, palm oil from non-NDPE compliant production into the market. Eight out of the top 25 refiners fall into this category in Indonesia and Malaysia. These are shown on, on the left side of the slide in the table. Um, and in addition, three of the four leading refiners in India have no NDPE commitment at all. Um, this is an important finding because India is the world's largest importer of crude palm oil. Um, so this creates another yeah, important leakage market. Um, 
these companies that are listed in this table have um, have been used as the basis of the analysis that I'm uh, going to hand over for to Enda now to present the findings from his analysis of financial relationships and policy assessments. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Barbara. This is Anna Kainer. I work as an equity analyst at Profundo. And well, with these, the list of uh, so-called leakage refiners, we, we, uh, we basically used uh, first in finance, first of, uh, financiers that are meaning uh, the loans and un underwritings flow to these companies uh, in a historical uh, context. So between 2015 and 2021, we found uh, $9.6 billion of financing flows to these companies. And this is on average uh, a, a 1.5 billion uh, annual financing, but we see kind of a, a, a declining trend, excluding 2019, which has a, 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 a special occasion of Salim groups, a, an increasing corporate loan from Bank Central Asia, which is also affiliated with the group. So next slide, please. So uh, out of uh, the 11 liquid refiners we have identified, we've, uh, we've seen uh, uh, financing flows to five. Uh, the remaining six companies are actually either small companies and they don't disclose their financial information. And uh, also uh, the, the part of their operations related to uh, palm oil cannot be separated from the other. Uh, within, these, uh, within the five that we've identified financing for, uh, Salim Group received the largest amount with 5.7 billion US dollars, followed by uh, PPPN with 2.1 and Tunas Boro Lumping with uh, 1.6 billion. Next slide, please. And uh, Within the breakdown of these fin financing countries or the uh, origin of financing uh, that we identified, only 5% came from uh, countries outside of East Asia region. So uh, the majority have come from uh, like 54% came from Indonesia and 23% from Japan and 9% uh, from uh, Singapore as the top three. Yeah, next slide, please. And then for the finances, we looked at the bank policies uh, recently assessed by Forest and Finance. This is useful for, uh, for us as we could, we could pinpoint which criteria within Forest and Finance that we can uh, use as a proxy for uh, let's say mitigating the risk of leakage refinance, uh, which was actually the policy on palm oil supply chain transparency. Um, as, we see, as we see uh, on the table, there's only one bank that has that uh, transparency uh, policy, which is DBS from Singapore. But again, uh, we've identified uh, uh, fin financing to uh, leakage refinance from that bank also. But out of the other, uh, all of the banks, there's no uh, palm oil supply chain transparency policies. And we think that this is uh, crucial. This uh, criteria is crucial in countering the leakage uh, palm oil reaching the global markets. Next slide, please. Again, on the uh, investor side, we've all also looked at the investors of these leakage refiners and uh, we found out that, uh, again, only BMP Paribas uh, has a, a palm oil policy on supply chain transparency, but again, we have identified a small but still uh, present uh, investment from BMP Paribas to a liquid refiner. Next slide, please. And overall, we, we com we've compared our findings uh, to a, a previous report again by CRR uh, back in 2018, again, looking at the investments and uh, financing uh, towards leakage refiners. Although the, the list of leakage refiners changed, we've seen the trend of 
Asian banks uh, increasing their exposure in terms of loans and underwritings, but the Western investors uh, decreasing their positions in uh, leakage refinance. The, the main variation uh, within the lists comes from uh, Unipresident Enterprises, which was uh, listed as a leakage refiner back in 2018, uh, then started to implement NDP policies, and now it's not on our list. And we've now identified more uh, financing towards Salim Group, which is a, a, a big receiver of funds uh, within our list. And we, we see that uh, compared to the previous report, seven financial institutions and six investors, which were uh, listed in 2018, are still active in the financing and investing in uh, leakage refiners. Yes, this is it from my side. Thanks, Ender. Uh, thanks, Ender, Barbara, and Ward for your uh, great presentations. Now um, we will get to the Q&A part of the event. Um, if you haven't put any questions in the Q&A uh, function, please do so now and we'll try and get to them in the, in the time we have remaining. So the uh, first question we have is for Ward on um, the forest and finance um, database. Do you look at all companies in a supply chain or just producers and traders? And do you look at investments in banks that invest in the six commodities? Yeah, thanks uh, for the question. So we, the focus of Forest and Finance is really upstream and midstream companies, uh, the companies that are most likely to engage in or uh, be related to, to these forest risks. Uh, uh, so we don't look at FMCGs or any downstream uh, operations. And we don't look at the investments in banks that invest in the six commodities. Uh, so we don't look at the indirect investments, but we have done so. And there's a couple of publications we've done. So for example, for Milieu Defensi, the Friends of the Earth, the Netherlands, uh, we wrote a report called Stepping Up the Leverage, uh, Stepping Up the Pressure, uh, which looks at uh, which financial institutions are financing these, uh, these financial institutions, these banks that are, these forest risk banks. And uh, also more recently, uh, uh, in 2017, we looked at the financiers of Maybank, for example, which was Maybank at, at the time was the largest uh, financier of Palm Oil, which is also the title of the report. Great, thanks, Ward. Uh, next question for you. What has been the response of financiers to the, uh, the methodology and criteria that you've used? Um, I'm not sure if the question is about the methodology we use to gather the data and, and make these segment adjusters in geographic adjusters, or if the, the question is about policies. So I'll try to answer both. Hopefully it'll cover um, whichever question was actually meant. Um, so we've shared the, um, well, I'll start with the policy assessments. We developed the policy assessments and shared them with a number of financial institutions and experts uh, to see if what we're asking of the financial institutions is reasonable and realistic. And we've made some slight adjustments on the basis of that feedback. And we did this, uh, the same process already three times with the forest and finance methodology in the, the previous iterations of the policy assessments. And each time we make these adjustments to, to be at least realistic, but, but uh, to be realistic, but make sure that the bar is high enough that the financial institutions have something to work, to work towards. Um, in terms of the financial research, uh, yes, we've, well, we receive uh, responses from financial institutions that uh, maybe sometimes types of financing, we're, we're talking about it in a different way. So we talk about the financial contributions. We don't talk about the exposure on their balance sheets. So there's sort of a difference in, ter in terms of interpretation or in terms of how we, we talk about these, times, uh, these terms of finance. Um, but they will also uh, appreciate the effort we make to try to calculate uh, segments and uh, to make these, these segments uh, adjustment uh, calculations and geographic uh, calculations. Because if, for example, a financial institution is financing cargo, well, not all of that money that's going to cargo is in the forest risk commodities that we're looking at. So the financial institution really appreciate the effort we make to try to, to calculate the proportion of that uh, company's business activities. In, uh, in palm oil and other of the forest risk commodities uh, so that the, the financing figures uh, seem to be, to be a better, better, a slightly better or a slightly more accurate uh, reflection of where the money is actually going. Great, thanks a lot for that, Ward. The next question for the group, um, do, the policy, do the refiner policies also include third-party trade or just their own production? That's also including third-party trade, yes. 
uh, yeah, uh, what qualifies as an NDPE policy should also look at uh, third party uh, procurement. Okay, thanks, Barbara. Uh, follow up to that is could you comment on where the um, leakage palm oil go, uh, it, where where it goes, where it eventually goes? Well, there are different um, there are different directions that the, the, the yeah the palm oil from non NDPE compliant uh, producers and and refiners goes. Um, well, first of all, there's um, there's a biodiesel market in Indonesia that has been growing quite substantially, and that uh, provides basically an escape route for leakage refiners um, that can uh, deliver into that market uh, without the requirement of a NDPE policy. And in addition, there are a couple of um, country markets that are very important and have much less um, requirements from, from buyers. For example, India as the largest um, buyer of um, crude palm oil, but also countries like Pakistan or Bangladesh, uh, to some degree also China. Okay, great, thanks. The next question is, can you uh, comment on why uh, many companies in Indonesia and Malaysia are weak on NDP implementation? Well, that, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, yeah, probably because there is still a market. Uh, if there would be nobody buying uh, buying that uh, product, then that, yeah, that would change. Yeah, <laughs> I guess that's the that's the argumentation. Okay, great. Uh, next question is: um, If you could uh, talk about the um, zero deforestation for um, companies like um, FMCGs like Mars and Nestle, are companies also moving to address deforestation through reforestation? Well, if they're um, if if a company has a, a um a well-defined NDPE policy, then that should also include uh, recovery of um, formerly converted forest and, and peat areas. Um, that is something, if you, if you look at the report that um, was published in 2020 by Chain Reaction Research, maybe we can post uh, um, paste that link also in the chat. Um, it shows that several of the, the leakage companies have no recovery plans also for for areas of forest and peat that they have um, converted, which, yeah, is, is uh, a typical thing of companies that um, fall into the leakage category. So uh, next question is about investments focused on, are, are about investments, are they, are they focused on large scale companies on the upstream side, or do we also observe any trends in investing in medium and small scale companies? So um, medium, uh, are we talking about investments in stock listed companies and, and the bonds of, of any companies? Then yes, we, we look at all companies. We have 380 companies and we look at them regardless of whether or not they're stock listed or, uh, or not. And we look at them regardless of the size we've, well, in, to a certain extent, we've selected the companies because they're the largest companies operating, but with 380 companies, you can imagine we already have uh, some medium sized companies. We don't have a lot of small, I don't know what you consider to be small, but anything with 5,000 hectares maybe is, is small or 2,000. So we don't have a lot of the smaller ones. Uh, in terms of the trends, um, well, you see asset managers and insurance companies, uh, particularly from abroad, investing more in the larger companies than the smaller companies. And the smaller companies are the ones where you see more local investments from, uh, from Southeast Asia, for example. Uh, also, you have to bear in mind that uh, not all the companies have a very large free float. You know, some of them are majority tycoon owned, so you have a free float of about 10, 15 percent. Um, so then in terms of the financing or the investment figures that we have in terms of ranking, then they'll, they'll be relatively small. Thanks, Ward. Next question for Ender and Barbara. If you could talk about what has contributed to the declining trend of financing and leakage refiners. Yeah, uh, actually, the, the number of uh, companies uh, committing to NDP uh, and implementing that 
is also a factor because in the end, uh, those companies used to be uh, uh, leakage refinance. Uh, now the financing going to those com uh, uh, companies are not classified in terms of our research as leakage refinance financing. That, that's one issue. And also I would say uh, NGOs writing about it is also, uh, and banks uh, publishing policies and implementing on them would be a, a factor also. Thanks, Ender. Next question for Ward. Um, how do you anticipate financial institutions will use their scores in for some finance database? Yeah, good question. So well, we've been doing this for a few years now, um, and we see that some financial institutions, well, a lot, increasingly financial institutions are open to engagement with us, with uh, Forest and Finance Coalition members, about the policy assessments and about their scores. So where initially it was mostly uh, the Western or European and North American financial institutions that were open to a conversation, now we're also having conversations with uh, financial institutions in Southeast Asia and, and East Asia. How they're using their scores or, uh, or in their initial reaction is to challenge the scores and say we didn't do it we didn't look at everything or they should be scored better for some elements uh, than we've uh, scored them um, but uh, we do see an improving trend so comparing the policy assessment scores over the years you do see improvements in their policies so how do they use their scores i think that actually it's two two things the one is uh, they use the scores but also their policy assessments uh, to try to improve their own policies but it's also how we use those scores to to be able to engage with the financial institutions in southeast asia and elsewhere to to encourage them to improve their their policies and their their risk mitigation frameworks Great, thanks. Thanks, Ward. And as a follow-up to that, uh, to you and Barbara and Ender, um, if you could talk about any um, work you've done directly with uh, banks that have been financing financing the leakage companies, to, in order to shift them to have pol to NDP policy and, and traceability data for the comp for the companies that they lend money to. Yeah, I think maybe one question here is how we we call them leakage refiners. Um, but in Southeast Asia, some of them would just be considered refiners, um, that their leaking is sort of iron, uh, the way we're talking about the fact that they're leaking non-certified uh, palm oil. Um, so the financial institutions that are financing these leakage companies, uh, well, as Ender has shown, uh, you know, the majority is actually coming from Southeast Asia, where they have a different interpretation, or maybe don't even consider leakage to be, to be uh, such a big issue. But, but that's my two cents. Maybe other colleagues have other thoughts on this no i think that uh, summarizes it very well yeah it, it doesn't mean because we call it leakage that it's illegal uh ndpe policies are not a, a legal obligation it's a it's basically a private sector um, um mechanism in that sense so it doesn't imply uh, legality or illegality in that sense Okay, great, thanks. The next question is, is the exposure of EU, UK and US investors highest through direct investment or indirect via uh, local banks? Well, because we don't look at indirect investments, I can't really comment on this. The, uh, the, the, the investments we look at directly are directly investments in bonds and shares of companies uh, uh, engaged in forest risk commodities, not through the, the local banks. Okay, great. Thanks for that clarification. So next question, in terms of available data and traceability, including um, with investors and banks, do you see the same challenges between Asia and Latin America? And are there specific aspects to consider in Latin America that, that you have mapped? Yeah, in terms of gathering the data on financial relationships and the traceability is maybe uh, a question more to Barbara um, but in terms of uh, investments in bonds and shares or financing of companies um, yeah the coverage and the level of disclosure differs for countries in Asia and uh, and also countries in, in Latin America so we find a lot of bilateral financing for stock listed companies in Indonesia, because in the annual reports of Indonesian companies, they, 
they list who their financiers are and actually give details on who has provided them a loan for what amount, for what period, and even what kind of guarantees and, and other conditions to those loans. The stock listed companies in Malaysia and Singapore, for example, there isn't that requirement and you can you can find maybe the principal bankers listed in sort of uh, in the color phone parts or the, the back cover or the, or the front of the reports, but you don't know what kind of financial relationship that is. But in uh, Malaysia and Singapore, you can look in the company registries and also in India, you can look at the company registries and you find uh, um, quite a wealth of information on the company charges. So there's a lot of uh, bilateral financing you can find there. For Latin American countries that differs, it's actually much more challenging. Uh, they, they have the, the shortcomings of, of the Southeast Asian countries uh, in the sense of the Brazilian companies that we're researching don't have to disclose in their annual reports who is financing them and also using the, the company registry or Jus Brazil, you can't find a, a lot of additional details there. So there we rely much more on the uh, BNDES uh, data and more on the syndicated financing data to, to make some kind of estimations. For Actually, for all regions, we know that the financing figures that we're providing are, are only a small part, uh, only a part <clears throat> of the total financing going to forest risk commodities. Um, we estimate that, that around 50 to 75% of the financing is, is most likely covered, but, but we're also, we know that we're missing some because of the disclosure requirements. You know level of transparency of financial institutions. I'm sorry, companies, level of uh, transparency of companies. On, on, the, on the traceability aspect, um, if you look at um, the, the flows of palm oil, like where, how it's traded globally, then obviously the streams from Southeast Asia are, yeah, they are uh, outsizing any other uh, producing regions. Um, Latin America plays an increasing role. Uh, the, the palm oil production is, is growing there. Um, but if you look at the supply chains of the large FMCGs, uh, consumer goods companies, then uh, this is still accounting for a relatively low, small share. Um, a lot of it stays in uh, Latin America. Um, but when it then comes to um, disclosure from by these uh, consumer goods companies, yeah, that then if they source from, say, Guatemala or Colombia or Brazil, then they will disclose that as well in their, in their suppliers list. So that doesn't, doesn't make uh, a difference where, where the palm oil is coming from. Great, thanks for those, uh, thanks for those answers. Uh, we have one, one question on uh, whistleblowers. It's a, a little different than um, the, um, uh, the discussion on, on, on the financial data that we've discussed during the panel. But if you could uh, comment, if any of you could comment on the role of whistleblower, whistleblowers in promoting the integrity of supply chains. I think it's a very interesting question. Um, and obviously, uh, yeah, it's very important anyways to A, have civil society uh, um, um, publishing on uh, shortcomings and, and breaches of environmental and, and social uh, requirements and um, and whistleblowers certainly are also uh, an interesting factor and if it's about for example the US laws there has been a case now that uh, FGV uh, the former Felder um, has been banned from the US last year because of um, reports on forced labor so if there is good evidence that yeah, that can have quite quite significant impacts on companies in in buyers basically breaking away or whole markets breaking away. So, in that sense, certainly whistleblowers as well as civil society play a very important role. Great, thanks a lot, Barbara. Um, back back to Ward. Um, there's a question on your uh, communication with the with the financiers. Um, and how often do you plan to communicate with them, and and what do you expect their um, reaction to be to um, to to the to the scores that you publish? Yeah, well, we have the policy assessments now scheduled for. Uh, well, we have two sets of uh, policy assessments scheduled, so we'll have them again in September, uh, and then again next year there'll be a, another update of the two hundred. And with each update, we send our policy assessments, the draft policy assessments to the financial institutions for 
well their verification or, or for them to look at and, and, and there's a due process to see if they want to make any comments so at least once a year um, some financial institutions are actually quite uh, appreciate this and and also make use of this opportunity to have further conversations uh, also around things like the the finan financial data how we collect it and also our expectations of uh, of the clients that they have uh, so much broader discussions than just the policies and how we believe that they should be then uh, organizing their due diligence process of course this is just for them to to get the information and but uh, some of them really do appreciate that opportunity um, so for some it's going to be more often than once a year um, because they will have that uh, they want to have that conversation also uh, some of the partners will be engaging with financial institutions on a case-by-case -case basis so if there's a case of uh, a rights violation or deforestation for example uh, where a financial institution can be linked to, then the partners, uh, Sabat Alam or Tuk or, or Rainforest Action Network will then engage with a specific financial institution or a group of uh, financial institutions about this. Mm, so, I can maybe oh, add ahead, to that, that yep. um, also from Chain Reaction Research, uh, we, we reach out to the financial institutions that are named in our reports as uh, financing, for example, leakage refiners to to discuss with them uh, on policy development and, and yeah their approach to who they finance and what kind of requirements they have. Great, thanks a lot, Barbara, and thanks again to our panelists for their time today. We're now um, we've now finished the the, the Q and A, and we want to thank everybody for attending and for for participating in this event. We will be having we will put the recording online in the next couple of days. And so uh, stay tuned for that. And if um, you want to, you would like to get in touch with any of us to follow up on any questions on this report or anything else that Forest and Finance and Chain Reaction Research publishes, please get in touch with us at any time.